Welcome to the Be Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Thanks for joining me today for another episode of the Be Bold Podcast and greetings from Ireland. I'm currently in County Galway on the west coast of the country on the smallest of the Aran Islands, which is in a shear, and that's uh, population 260. I've been here less than two days and have already met or come in contact with at least 10% of the population, and I've walked probably half of the island. So you get the sense of how small this community is. I'm here with a group of women for our inaugural Ireland tour. We've already been to Dublin and Galway and are headed back to the mainland tomorrow to spend the next week exploring the wild Atlantic Way. And that's the coastline uh, on the west coast of the country that includes the Cliffs of Moher, uh, which uh, many of you should be familiar with. If you haven't been to Ireland and you've considered going, pop on over to the wandertours.com website. You can click on the contact form and send me a note so I can let you know when I'll be leading another tour here. And for sure, I can promise you great stories from the locals, classes in Irish soda bread making and other specialties, spectacular scenery, and Guinness and whiskey tastings. There'll likely be a little bit of rain, but we have been really fortunate. I guess we've got the luck of the Irish on our side. We've had very little rain. It's a lit, little bit blustery, a little bit cool, but it has been uh, sunny blue skies for us much of the time, so it's been great. Okay, on to today's episode. First, I have to fully admit that I can't pronounce the last name of today's guest, so I'm going to have her do it for me so that I don't totally butcher it. It's Alison Tvaladze. Alison first landed on my radar when I came across an article about her suing Delta Airlines because of an incident that happened on a flight in April 2016. During that flight from Seattle to Amsterdam, Allison was sexually assaulted uh, by another passenger. Now, we don't get into the details of what happened uh, during our conversation. You can Google it for more information. But in short, let's just say the flight attendants weren't equipped to handle the incident. For the past two years, Allison has been trying to get legislation passed that will require airlines to implement procedures when occurrences like this happen. Right now, there's nothing, no real way for them to deal with something like this. And they happen more often than you might think. It's just that they don't get reported. So there are no statistics about any kind of assault, sexual or otherwise, uh, in flight. With the help of Washington State Senator Patty Murray, Allison has had some luck in getting a bill passed on the House floor, and you'll hear more about that and how it all came about during our conversation. Now, that alone would have been an interesting conversation with Allison, but before I reached out to her and I invited her on the podcast, I did a bit of research and I discovered that her advocacy for women ran much deeper than just this one issue. Allison is currently the Director of Global Strategy, Partnerships, and Advocacy at the University of Washington. What she does is she travels the world to help build partnerships and networks that support advocates of women's cancers, specifically breast cancer. And this is often in low-resource settings such as developing nations and communities. Her work is fascinating, and she gets into some of the details of it in this conversation. But what is really striking is how she got to this point in her life, meaning uh, her early travels and adventures and how her natural inclination to help women not only has been a thread in her work life, but in her volunteer work and now this advocacy for women travelers. One little other thing, too, to top it all off, she's part of an eight-woman team who will be sailing from Port Townsend, Washington to Juneau, Alaska this summer. That'll be 750 miles on a sailboat during this adventure race. So yeah, she's pretty amazing on many fronts. With that, please enjoy this fascinating conversation with Alison Tvaladze. So you showed up here in rainy, <laughs> on a completely rainy day, <laughs> uh, but you're all dressed in pink and you're like all happy and you've got a pink Starbucks cup. It goes and, everywhere uh, with me. Yeah. I never travel without it. Oh, and it's a oh, secret it's a of travel that you, I always have my own cup. 
everywhere I go. And people can always figure out where I'm sitting at a meeting because they see the Because they see that. And I see now that it's got a little branding on it yes, with it your does. sale like a girl. It and does. that's a decal. So yeah, it comes that's off. that's a sticker, yeah. Oh, good, good. Yeah. And we'll talk about that, yes. sale like a girl also. So that'll be good. Do you always wear pink? No. Is pink your color? Orange is my, orange mm. and pink, I guess. I have a lot of pink, but I, I think orange. Anything bright. Well, Red, I thought, orange. I pink. thought your work with the breast cancer right. that, that fit in just perfect. It I does. thought, well, because I'm almost always in purple. I've yeah. got somewhere I've got purple on me. And I thought, maybe she's the pink gal. She's <laughs> always got pink on. Who knows? I don't know. So anyway. I, know, I think for, for my pink, my orange, my cup, my heels, Mm-hmm. And lipstick. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> you know, I've got a, uh, I've got a website and a book, Wanderlust and Lipstick, yeah. and I don't wear lipstick. <laughs> but uh, Wanderlust and uh, lip balm or chapstick didn't, it uh, no, wasn't quite I, good. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, thanks for coming today. Absolutely. I really appreciate it. And I am so excited to chat with you. And uh, in uh, like a, on one level, when I read your bio, I thought, oh my gosh, how do I not know this person <laughs> already? Because you are such an adventurer at heart. I can tell like the stories and we'll get into those stories because they are absolutely amazing. But then on another level, we're on a completely different path too. So you're on a very much a professional path and you've been able to tie in travel with that. And that's, I mean, I do, I have a, I have a business, Mm -hmm. it's a travel business, but I wouldn't consider it the go into a cubicle and kind of wear my heels and my lipstick and (laughs) my frilly pink yeah. Close, um, but that's great. So I want to hear about that, and I'm I, I'm really excited to learn more about the many facets of what you do. So yes. let's dive in. Now, you're from Bainbridge Island, which is a island just off of Seattle, right? What was it like growing up there? I grew up there. I never thought I'd be commuting on a ferry for the rest of my life. I watched my father do it my whole childhood, and thought, oh no, that's not for me. But here I am. I've been doing it since 2004, and actually, I think it's probably the best commute. Why didn't you want to do it? I just thought, you know, I for years before I moved back, I could always walk to work, and I thought being able to walk to work was really the greatest way to go. But then because you were working on the island? No, I was working over, I, I, in Washington, D.C., oh, in see. other countries, mm-hmm. in, in Tbilisi, the country of Georgia, and all sorts of other places where I could either walk to work or take public transportation that was, you know, 10, 15 minutes to get to work. So you didn't want to do the ferry thing. I just did not. But but we came back and it was going to it was temporary at first. And then, you know, I, I think it is really one of the best commutes. I always tell people I can walk for 35 minutes. I can do work. I can have a drink legally. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's not bad. I know when I'm, I don't have to sit in traffic. I think if I ever had to sit in traffic, I would lose my mind. And then do you just take the bus when you land yeah. on the other side? Yeah. And then, you, and then uh, do you keep your, do you keep a car at the ferry dock or? Not usually. I can take a bus from my house. Oh, you can take a bus. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Or I get someone to drop me off. And it doesn't, I, I, I know a lot of people because we, we have so many islands around right. here. I know a lot of people who live on islands and they do love it. If you live on an right. island and you're, you are commuting, you learn to love right. it. And I think it's, you know, I grew up with it. So I, it doesn't bother me now at all. And I, I came back when we, we had children there. And I think really for children, it's a magical place to grow up. You know, wonderful well, schools, a very tight knit community. And I've been through things in my life where I can't imagine not having that island community to help help get through. Well, your home sounds amazing. It is. Can it's you talk cool. about that? Sure. So we live in a building that was built in 1909 as part of the Fort Ward um, base on Bainbridge Island. And it was a torpedo storage at some point. It was a boat storage. It's been moved three times. It was renovated and turned into a beautiful home with lots of character and marks on the floor. So it's the original floors and 13 foot ceilings. And the family, the Davidsons who turned it into our home that we love so much did the amazing work and made it a very beautiful, special place to be. It's very unique. Oh, I bet. And do your kids love it? You have two kids. We have two kids. Yes. And it's fun. Their friends live in the former jail. And our neighbors live in the stables. No and kidding. I had no idea that old, was over there. Yeah, there's a bunch of old buildings. Some people live in old, the bunkers have been converted into homes and the officer's quarters. Have been is it all within one little area? Or yeah, is it within the south the- end of the island. But there's other homes mixed in between because it was a large, there was the parade grounds. So the kids play soccer on the parade grounds. And there's a large, uh, they close the road that goes along the water. So they ride their bikes up and down there. There's beach and lots of fun stuff. And old, like exploring the woods where there's still old bunkers and gun positions. And oh, I bet that is great for the kids. Great trails. Especially, yeah. yeah. And my parents are still there. So their grandparents are 10 minutes away. So it's wonderful to have family close by, so especially you, with my schedule. So you commute. Yeah. You take the bus. So it's a 35-minute boat ride. 
And there's a group of us that's often walking on the top deck doing laps. Oh, good, good. Even in the rain? In the rain. <laughs> oh, good for you. Sometimes they close the deck when it's too slippery, but... Yeah. And then uh, you hop on the bus and yeah. your bus ends at, where do you Fred, work? So I work for the University of Washington, but I sit on the campus where Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and Seattle Cancer Care Alliance are. So it's South Lake Union. East and Lake. when I saw you today uh, and you, you were, we were driving around the neighborhood a little bit and um, you were marveling at the beautiful uh, blooms yeah. and you said, I was away for a month. And uh, I came back to spring, yeah, and it is beautiful. It is. And I said, where'd you go? And you said? I was in New York, Paris, Johannesburg, Lusaka, <laughs> layover in Amsterdam, Seattle for a day, and then Puerto Rico for 10 days. And then that was part work, part vacation. The Puerto right. Rico part was, was vacation. Right. So the first half was work, and Puerto my sister lives in Puerto Rico, so we go every spring with the kids and visit the cousins it is my parents were there too. all the um locations that you just mentioned is it as glamorous as it sounds when you when i hear that i think oh my gosh lusaka paris huh? right amsterdam wow sometimes it's so fast uh i obviously i love to take advantage as much you know take the opportunities that, that are presented to me and, and soak up as much as i can so i was in new york for work and i walked 10 miles a day to meetings and back just to try to soak up the city i love to walk walking not I, in your heels oh yeah always in oh my heels. in your heels oh, always oh in my, my goodness heels. and i you know we had a we were in paris for 13 hours we were there for uh, just for the day but with a colleague and we walked 13 miles and then you know so when i'm in cities like paris new york or copenhagen I walk as much as I can because often when I'm in Dar es Salaam or Nairobi or, you know, it's not easy to walk around. Right. Um, there's not the sidewalks. There, it's just they're not friendly walking cities. And you're stuck in traffic a lot. So, And if you're a woman walking on right. your own, it's probably not the safest also. Right. And so when I'm in those cities too, I'm not going to say it's glamorous. It's for work. So we're often in cancer centers or we're at meetings. So we're in hotels and conference rooms or traffic, lots of traffic. The traffic has just, you know, it sucks up a lot of time. But yeah, so we're often, we're meeting with women survivors of cancer and we're also working with policymakers, working, meeting with ministries um, and also with the clinicians. So we spend a lot of time in both in cancer centers and uh, in in meetings, government and th buildings. This is this is your New York work as well as. So you, do you do some domestic no. work? No. So the the meeting I was in New York for a meeting that was the National Cancer Institute Center for Global Health annual meeting. I was there. It was it's sort of the annual get together of our small community of people working in global oncology. We get together once a year at, in at a meeting that the NCI hosts to talk about what's going on. And then when you're doing the international travel, what, what does a day consist of when you're meeting with folks there? Uh, they usually start early and end late. So I'm trying to think I recently I was in Panama and we flew about we took a 20 minute flight from Panama City to uh, another sm a smaller province. I think we were up at left at 7am. We were out 7 a.m. till about 6 p.m., driving maybe two hours, visiting a clinic. So we would visit the regional government health center, and then we would visit a primary care facility, do the tour, sort of a lot of observation. I think it, it really is important to be able to see. I, I look around and see what information's on the walls, how many people are waiting, what is the layout, what's available. In one of the facilities we just visited, the pathologist said, yes, when they built this facility, they forgot about pathology. So I'm in the morgue. And so we visited. And I always I say, take me to your gross room or lo yeah. lose me forever. <laughs> um, so I, I have this obsession with visiting pathology labs. And then... But that's part of your work. Yeah, that's yeah. my work. Yeah. <laughs> and so we'll we'll do this. So this trip to Panama was, you know, drive two hours, visit three health facilities, drive another... We, we, were, we were working our way back to the capital through four regions of Panama, visiting as many health centers as we could. And are you consulting with them uh, in terms of their setup, in terms of how they're working with patients? So this was more information gathering. Right now we're going to be doing an assessment and working with them as they design metrics and solutions to improve their capacity. So it's, this was helping give us a better sense of where they are so that we can work together and figure out what might work best using evidence that we have from other projects and, and systems. How do you find the clinics that you work with? Oh, amazing. The people who work there work under amazing 
very challenging situations. They're understaffed, under-resourced. They do so much with what they can. Do they find you or are you out there searching for these? No, we don't go searching. It's usually they come to us and they come. They say help. They come to us through. It's a very small community in, in the global cancer world. Oh, is it? Okay. So, you know, some of these countries may only have 10 oncologists and, you know, maybe they don't have any radiation treatment. So, and it's not like other health systems where you'll have this care available throughout the country. In in a low resource setting, cancer care is typically only going to be available in the capital and maybe one or two other cities. So are we talking like like Zambia as an example? Right. So, so they may only have one cancer center in Lusaka. In the capital, capital, yes. So, you know, and in Uganda, you really have to come to Kampala. That's the cancer center that you know, the Uganda cancer. So Institute. everyone knows each other there. Right. And once they hear about you and your resources and what you could do, then the word kind of probably right. spreads. And then... And and there's a global network, the Union for International Cancer Control. And we work very closely with the National Cancer Institute's global branch, um, Komen's global branch. So American Cancer Society, we're, we're all like a family. We're very, very small. So we, we know each other. That sounds fun. Yes. I mean, that, that you have, I mean, the, I'm sure the work is very challenging, but the fun part is that it's a small community. It's a small international community. Yes. A very passionate people. And so these meetings are often meant these reunions where we get to catch up and learn. And always I learn something new about a program that we should, we want to find out more about, about what, something someone has done that's been a success. And so a lot of what we're doing right now, too, is trying to find those success stories. How do we do a better job of disseminating them? You know, not necessarily just through peer-reviewed publications, but how can we help people learn about those those solutions? What would be the um, example of a, of a success story? Oh, <laughs> let me think. Um, right now... You know, I, as I think about it, we're we're, set, we're trying to build a community of practice, and we are looking at solutions for improving communications among providers. You know, I'm trying to think of you know the, the success stories might sometimes be just an individual who has figured out how to improve communication between the pathologist and the surgeon so that the tumor is being stored properly and isn't. So in some countries, for example, you go in for a biopsy and the tumor is removed and it's put in a bucket and then it's up to the patient to take it to a pathologist, but they may have to wait until they have enough money to pay for the pathology tests. And so, they're in 85 degree weather. So they may be waiting. It may take them a week until they oh. have the money. So by the time, these are worst case scenarios, by the time the tissue makes it to the lab, it's useless. It's useless to the pathologist. They won't be able to produce That's heart-wrenching. Any information from that tissue. So looking for places where they have streamlined that process and they've been able to get the tissue properly stored and to the lab in a you know, reasonable amount of time. I'm trying, you know, as you asked me some good stories and solutions, <laughs> I'm, I'm blanking, of course, right now. You know, I think success stories, when I think about the advocates, I think of, you know, the women we work with in Uganda. There's a woman, Gertrude Nakagude, at the Uganda Women's Cancer Society, and she's amazing. And when we first met, she had a, a full-time job. She's a cancer survivor, and she was volunteering to run this group of survivors. And we started working together on some grant proposals and they received a, a large grant and that allowed her to leave her job and become the first full-time paid executive director of this cancer, uh, this group of cancer survivor advocates. She trained her advocates to do research. They did qualitative research to better understand the needs of metastatic patients in Uganda. And she's now the first survivor advocate sitting on the board of the Uganda Cancer Institute, which I think is a huge achievement. That is huge. And to see, to watch her grow and the the success she's had over the last years has been very inspiring. How many years have you been doing this? So uh, working, I've been working with Gertrude and since 2014. 
Yeah. And then your work in this capacity has been for how long? So I, I've been at the University of Washington since 2005, but in different capacities. So I originally was the assistant director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies in the Jackson School, which let me do anything within that region. I'm sorry, what was your position there? I was the assistant director in the set in the okay. Ellison Center, okay. not the Allison Center. Okay, yeah. It often, the often, El- yeah. So it's the it, you know it's Russia, <laughs> Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and often people f- who are Russian speakers didn't hear the difference between Ellison and mm-hmm. Allison, so mm-hmm. they just thought it was my center. That's great. <laughs> but, you could take the credit right, for that exactly. And and it was during that I think this evolution of my work before that, which was really in political transition in post Soviet states, I used to work in that. So I came out of this field of political transition, working in Azerbaijan and Georgia and Turkey and Russia in the, after the breakup of the Soviet Union. And I did that for several years and started and saw the transition, what was happening. And, and the, at that time, it was a lot about election reform and civil society development. And I thought, this is great at watching this transition. People now are having, at that time, they were gaining more rights around voting and speech and other rights. However, they were dying younger. There was a lot of investment into the political and economic transition, but not a lot of investment into the health transition. What good is all of this development if you're dying? So I became increasingly interested in women's health. And at the time, I thought to go into that field, I needed an MD and before I could do an MPH. So I put it off for a while. But when we came back to Seattle... And, and the MPH is a master's sorry, in public right, health. master's okay. in public health. I realized I was very passionate about it, but I thought it was too late for me. I, I hadn't gone to medical school. And the people I knew who had MPHs had MDs. And I thought it was sort of like the JD LLM. You would never do a, a, an LLM without a, a JD. So I just sort of pushed it to the back of my head. And we came to Seattle and I started working at the University of Washington. I was looking for a job that would allow me to continue to focus on that part of the world, specifically the Caucasus and Central Asia, Turkey. I had studied Russian. I learned Russian when I was 17. And then I had studied Turkish at Georgetown. And I was really passionate about uh, sort of the East Mediterranean, sort of from Turkey through Syria and Lebanon. Is that your background? My, no. Your heritage? No, my father's family is Swedish and my mother is a mix of Scottish and Gypsy. That's the travel part for me. That's the wandering part. It, it's the Gypsy blood. Okay, because <laughs> your hair is jet black. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so Swedish? Uh, I don't know about no, that. Oh yeah, no, and all, and all the Swedes in our family have dark hair. <laughs> okay. There's one outlier. My sister has a blonde daughter, but uh, okay. we're all dark. Okay. So... You know, I came, I wanted to continue. So my, my, in undergrad, I was, I studied at Georgetown in the School of Foreign Service and always passionate about international issues, transitioned later as I got to University of Washington and worked there. And I, it allowed me to work on the region across different topics. So from health to politics and literature and really anything, look across the campus at anything anyone on campus was doing in that part of the world and try to boost it and amplify and bring regional knowledge to those programs. So we developed study abroad programs and we also sought funding to provide more courses around that part of the world. So I was really an advocate for that part of the world. Right. And then you became an advocate for women. For women. I developed the first study abroad to Georgia for University of Washington, and I was supposed to lead it in 2008 in the fall. And I had my first child in June, the day after my husband finished graduate school. And we were supposed to go on the study abroad in August. And in August of 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. And so we had to cancel the study abroad program. However, we had the first grandson, and the grandparents were in Georgia. And my husband and I, you know, sat every day. Are we going? Are we not going? Are we going? And we were watching what was happening. We were watching the attacks. His parents had very little information. So we were on Skype giving them news about what was happening. And so there was a ceasefire on August 13th. And we flew in on August 19th with our 10-week-old child. And I was no longer leading a study abroad. My, my husband 
was displaced as a child. He, it's, you know, an internally displaced person. So often the term refugee is used, but an IDP is someone who's displaced within their own country. So he was originally displaced across a border, but then returned to Georgia. So he's from Western Georgia, Abkhazia, and they were displaced during the war in 92, uh, and then returned to live in the capital of Georgia. So he had gone through war and being pushed out of your home at 13. And here we were in the capital of Georgia and, you know, more than 40,000 people had just rushed in from parts of Georgia that had been occupied by Russia. So I thought, you know, I just had a child in the comfort of Swedish hospital in Seattle. How many women were either in labor or just gave birth or about to give birth among these 40,000 people who came by foot, many by foot through the mountains. So we spent five weeks going sort of shelter to shelter. And most people, they go to wherever, anything that's empty. So a school or you you go anywhere you can. So they were taking shelter in schools and anywhere they could find space. And we would look for women who were pregnant. And I had my son in the pack in the front. And I, it was a great way to meet women and just sit down and talk to them and ask them what they needed. And I learned in that So this time. just came out of a natural... We can't just sit here for five weeks. What are we yeah, going to do? <laughs> right, right. So just this natural urge to help because yeah. you saw what was going what on. What can we do? Mm-hmm. And and my husband having been through that. So, so we just sort of started asking women what they needed. And a lot of women wanted formula. And I was very curious about the fact that, that very few women were breastfeeding. I had, there's a lot of also stories about why health things happen to you in other cultures, right? If you, if you sit on the cement, if you, you'll freeze your ovaries, you won't have children. And I always felt a little uncomfortable about the reason women were given for why they couldn't have children or why they got these illnesses, right? It was something they did wrong. There's often this tendency to blame a woman for something that has nothing to do with what happened to her. So I was really bothered by that. And in general, bothered by how women's health is addressed here too. I mean, I think it's a problem in and it's universal. So we we did that for five weeks. And I was, I came home from that trip. And I said, I don't care, I'm going to figure out how to do my MPH. And so I came back to the University of Washington, and I went down to the Department of Global Health and said, you know, I have been, I graduated a long time ago, but I really have to go back to oh, school. And this you. is what I have to do. And I'm going to find a way to do it. And so I spent that next year taking all the requirements that I needed to, to prove that I, you know, hadn't done, you know, it'd been a long time since I'd been in math. So I did, you know, biostatistics and all the hardest courses to show that I was serious and committed about this and wanted to pursue it. And then I, I did it. So I did my master's in public health with a focus on Eastern Europe and Central Asia, which is not an area that most global health programs have content for. And I also was specifically interested in non-communicable diseases, which is also, so I was sort of the black sheet in that regard. And then, you know, something happened. My And my husband, in the middle of this, my husband took a job on the East Coast. So I stayed here with our two-year-old and was pregnant with our second child. And during that, I, you know, I decided to do my research for my thesis on beliefs around breast cancer in Georgia and what are perceptions of women's of breast health and what are the barriers and facilitators for women to seek care or, and, and sit to seek you know, treatment and care. And I learned a lot through that. So I did my research in, in, in Russian and Georgian and English and interviewed women. And in that, in, in a lot of places, you still don't use the word cancer. And my boss always tells a story of when she first got to Ukraine in 1997 and she stepped off the plane and she was there to do work in breast cancer and she was met by the press and they said, okay, tell us what you're here to do, but don't use the word breast and don't use the word cancer. Oh gosh. So there's so much stigma around this issue and blame and no one talks about it. It's a lot like cancer here, I think in the 1950s. So it's that, shh, don't, we don't talk about it. And I interviewed a lot of women and learned about what they thought about breast cancer, why they thought they got it. And it was a lot of blaming themselves. What did they say? They had done something wrong. It was punishment. There's a lot of misinformation out there. I do a lot of reviewing 
materials put out in other countries. And you would not believe some of the things I see that a lot of it puts the blame on the women. So in one set of materials that I read, you know, it says that as a preventive measure, women should not drive. Yeah, because, (laughs) and this is the logic, it says that women are bad drivers. And so if they're driving, they will crash. And when they crash, they'll hit the steering wheel and that will give them breast cancer. Oh my goodness. And then, you know, it tells, they tell them that abortion. Can you say what country that was? That was actually Russia. And, or they say, you know, for preventive measures, women should cover their breasts with both hands in crowded places. They say that, you know, women have been told that they weren't having enough sex with their husband and that's why they got breast cancer or it, you know, it's a curse on the family and in, in other countries that, you know, women don't want anyone to know that they have breast cancer because their daughters won't be able to get married or their husbands will leave them. They don't want a mastectomy because they believe the soul is in the breast. So I was really curious to, and and, you know, when you do the, there's qualitative research and quantitative research and there's clinical trials and there's all this research and quantitative and clinical trials will tell you if something works or doesn't work, but they don't tell you why. And what I love is that qualitative research where you get in and you ask people and you ask those questions that tell you why something does or doesn't work. So, you so know, you're marrying the two of those, yeah. and when you go in there and you're you're bringing them both, both together, yeah. And I think they're so important to each other and to understanding why things work and don't work. And you really also have to understand the context in which these women are living and why they make decisions. I think one thing that often kind of stuck with me and bothered me was this tendency to say that women were fatalistic and that's why they weren't seeking care. But in reality, when you talk to them, you realize it wasn't fatalism. It's women making a very conscious decision about the future of their family. It is expensive to seek care and they want to save those resources for their children. But we do the same thing here. We do the exact same thing. And so this was what I was working up towards. So when I was pregnant, you know, I had done my research and I was working on writing it all up. And I went to Georgia with my current boss to do a, an advanced site visit to meet with a bunch of the Georgian Ministry of Health and clinicians because we were going to work with advocates there. And I came home and the next day, my mother was di- diagnosed with leiomyosarcoma, a very rare cancer, complete shock. We had no idea that that was even a concern, something that she might, it, it was just sort of a fluke that she found it. And working through the health system here was incredibly challenging. And I come from a family that has resources and position and education and all these things that should make that we have access to resources. And so I thought, what about people who don't speak English? What about people who don't have a job? How, how do they ever work through this system? And as we got through, worked through it and insurance wasn't going to cover what my, the, the care that my mother and father wanted her to have, my father said, that's fine, I'll pay for it out of pocket. My mom said that I'm not going to have the treatment. Mm. And I was sitting there thinking, this is the exact same. So, yeah. And it's not fatalism. And I, so I find I get frustrated when, when, it's, when wit, women are written off as fatalistic because I think that they're consciously making a decision about the future of their family and they're choosing to put those resources towards their children. So it's, it's a resource. Decision. Whether it's verbalized that way or right. no. really conscious, right. it, it's, it's happening. And right. it happens all the time here yeah. too. It's, right. It's and so really it was sort of watching this happen in, in Georgia where, you know, it's my adopted home and my husband's from there and his parents and families there seeing it happen there, seeing it happen here. I see it happen in a lot of places. So that's one of those universal challenges and that we have to try to address in helping women seek care. But often what I found with the Georgian women is what what was it that in the end motivated them to seek care? It was often their children saying we you know we need to do Well, this. I was going to say that would that would be a great motivator yeah. is just to show them that they need to be around yeah. for their kids and their family. Yeah. yeah. So, so your work sounds really fascinating. Yeah. Are there other women or men uh, in your field who are doing something similar in the United States or around the globe? Definitely. There's a, there's a community of us and we work together and we're spread around the country and around the world. It's an incredible network. Like you know, how I'm many on of WhatsApp. You? I, I don't know how to quantify because whether you, 
where you draw the line. You know, it, it's both the clinicians and the public health professionals and the survivor advocates and the policymakers. So it's not just, you know, I'm one piece of that. But there's so, it's really multidisciplinary. And it takes the medical oncologists and the surgeon and the pathologist and the survivor and the, you know, the person in the Ministry of Health. It, it, we all bring a piece of it. So, you know, I don't know how to quantify those numbers. But mm -hmm. I, understand, but I think yeah. what's amazing is that, you know, I look through my WhatsApp, my phone, and I reached out to an oncologist in Romania this week to see if he could go to Ghana because we need to help some people in Ghana. And I thought, well, maybe, he could be the perfect person. So it's this sort of, in my head, these people all over the world and that yeah, that's lovely. We're connecting in different places. Yeah, we live at a, in a great time now, don't we? Yeah. Where we, oh. Where we can be so connected. My goodness, I think back, you know, we didn't talk about this, but I, finished, I graduated from high school in Bainbridge when I was 17. I was a little bit young. And my parents wanted me to take a year off, to do a gap year at a time when that was not done here. When nobody knew what a gap nobody year was. Knew. Our cousins in Denmark did it, and my parents thought that was a great idea. So I decided to go. Well, first, I went and traveled in Europe by, with my best friend. So we went for a month and traveled. And then I flew to Moscow, and I went to live in Siberia for a year at 17. And so I went and I danced. I wanted to see what it was like to learn a language without translation. So I spent... I, I, I got there in the summer of 92, so six months after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I Why Siberia? Um, so my mother, so Bainbridge Island has this unique relationship with a theater. So Bainbridge had a, a theater program that was connected to a theater program in Novosibirsk, which is the third largest city in Russia. So it's in Siberia, it was around 2 million people. And my mother had been a costume designer for theaters and she had connected with this theater. And I had gotten to know a lot of the people from that theater and the choreographer and the composers and the composer's son lived with my family and they kept asking us me to come live with them. And they, so it wasn't totally random. No, it wasn't. Oh, I think I'll go to right. like, where would you not go? Siberia. I'll go I to thought, Siberia. I'll, that's a place I wanted. What motivated me? I wanted to see what it was like to learn a language without translation. And I had been invited. But, and then I thought, you know, why don't I go? So, but I, there were only three Americans in the city at the time and I never saw them. And the people that I knew in Novosibirsk really left when I got there. So I didn't know, I didn't know the alphabet. I, I knew nothing. So I spent that year dancing in the theater and, and learning Russian. And I lived with a 70 year old woman from Harbin, China. She was the Jew. She was part of the Jewish population, Russian Jews in China that were then kicked out and landed. She landed back in, in Siberia in Novosibirsk. So I, I spent a year there. And that year really shaped me. I don't think I was as, I, I don't think I was a, a very confident teenager. I was adventurous and challenged myself. But I think that year abroad, being by myself, that those first few months when I couldn't communicate, I couldn't speak to anyone. It was really, I was in my head. Mm -hmm. I read, a, my father packed a box of Russian literature for me and I read Anna Karenina and, and Brothers Karamazov and we, I just read all the Ru Russian literature I could and walked around. And it was it, funny story is the woman I lived with, she was 70 and she in the beginning wouldn't let me go outside by myself because she thought I'd be kidnapped by the Georgian fruit traders. So the joke is I actually had to go to Georgia to get kidnapped. <laughs> He's not a fruit trader, but he is Georgian. So I, I you don't know. So, so I spent that year in, in Russia and that was incredibly, that shaped a lot of, that, that helped me become a more confident person. Well, you, yeah. Solo I, time. Yeah. Something <laughs> that I, um, I actually pulled from your, your uh, bio um, and we'll talk about where that bio came from in, yeah. in uh, just a bit. But the, the bio said, she once flew to a remote location with a minister of defense oh. to amnesty rebels and trade guns for farm equipment, hiked in the mountains of Sinai with Bedouins, yeah. parasailed off the top of the Caucasus mountain, Caucasus, is that right? The Caucasus the mountains. The Caucasus mountains. Yeah. Water skied the Potomac in November, mm -hmm. hitchhiked solo from Tbilisi, Georgia, to the south of France. And 120 hours, and spent her maternity leave delivering aid to foreign or to aid to refugees. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit of adventure there, <laughs> and that all started when you were 17. Yeah, or before. You know, my my father had sabbaticals when I was a kid, and so we, my mom figured the only way to keep him from going to the office was to leave the country. So we, the first one, we went and rented a house in Sweden in 1984 and lived there and traveled around, 
and the second So they really time. instilled in you this sense of adventure and this love yeah. of, of travel. Yeah. Where did they get it from? Do you know? You know, so my mom always says she lived her life backwards and she started adventure. She, the first time she went to Europe was when we went. And my father, though, started younger. He had an aunt who was an amazing adventurer and was on some of the first flights after World War II to Europe. She was a librarian and she traveled. She took my father on trips to Europe when he was young. So, so your mom, by living her life backwards, yeah. meaning she got more adventurous right. as she got older. Yeah. Good for yeah. her. So, so she really inspired that. And I think they always encouraged me to do it. And I am surprised I'm a mother now. And I think, how on earth did they let, did they do that? <laughs> well, so let's talk about how your, they let go. <laughs> you, you have a son who's nine, nine. is that right? And yes. your daughter is five. She's uh, five, yeah, so she's about to turn six. So tell me about your daughter specifically, yeah, because I, uh, I, I wonder where she gets that so, from. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think she's, I thank her. I, you know, we, I was talking about how I was pregnant with her and my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And, and the week she was born, my husband came from, he'd been in Qatar and he flew in and I finished work and I finished my thesis and I finished my practicum and my mom was finishing treatment and... I did the defense of my oral, my thesis, and I started from behind the podium, and they said, oh, we can't hear you. Could you, could, could you get closer to the microphone? And I <laughs> no. said, no, because it was Friday, and I was due on Monday. Oh, and so I had to stand in the front. So I, I always laugh that our children, are their timing is perfect. Our son was born the day after my husband finished graduate school, and my daughter was, our daughter was born the day after I finished graduate school. But we're not going back to school. We're done. Yeah, good. Um, so she, and no more kids. Right. He, he is this calm, old soul who's just a rock. And Amelia is a firecracker. So, Does she have a sense of adventure? Oh, definitely. And she, we were just in Puerto Rico, and there's a park that she always wants to go to when we're there. It's the Amelia Earhart Park. And so she is just a huge fan of Amelia Earhart. And we go to the park, and, and she says, you know, this park is named after me. Hmm. And she wants to be a scientist. But, you know, she's an adventurer. They, they've traveled, you know, like I said, Nico's first trip to Georgia, he was 10 weeks old right after the, you know, actually during the ceasefire when part of the country was still occupied and Amelia's we've taken them every year to their grandparents. Um, and we've taken them, you know, one year for spring break, we went to Mexico city and people said, what, why are you taking, we had a one year old and a four year old, you're going to Mexico city. They, they still ask to go back to Mexico city. When are we going back to Mexico? Well, good city? for you. Yeah, I know. I I've heard the, um, I don't have kids myself, but yeah. I've heard, I've heard both sides of the, where, don't bring the kids early because they're not going to remember it anyway and not be able to enjoy it or just bring the kids. Bring and usually it's, it's, I can, I usually think it's like European people, the friends that I have who say, just take the kids. Take the like what? Well, and not European. I w don't even want to say it's European. It's all foreign people yeah. that I know outside of the U S say, just bring the kids, mm -hmm. you know, why not? Because That's, then they get used to right. it and then you get used to traveling with them. Right. I think people stress kids. often about traveling with small children and I think you just have to do it. And one of the jokes in our family and this, we can talk about later too, is that, you know, is our superpower and it's our superpower is sleep. We are magic when it comes to your sleep. family. My, my, it's, my, it comes from me, but I pass it on <laughs> to the children. And um, really it's what allows me to do the work I do too, because we manage jet lag. We can sleep when we need to. I'm, I've never been a napper. I can't nap. However, I can get on a, I can just adapt to a time zone, bam, straight on. And I do the same thing, yeah. I'm a, but I'm, I can nap, but yeah. it, I nap for five minutes. Oh, so yeah. And then it's like, right. I'll just say, I need to, I need to lay down and then I'll lay down and then I'm awake five yeah. minutes later and right. I'm like, I feel great. Yeah. yeah. But I'm the same way on planes. As a matter of fact, tomorrow I'm leaving for Ireland. That's right. And I always get a window seat because then I can just tuck in yeah. and go to sleep for the flight. I just got upgraded to economy with comfort. extra, yeah, yeah, comfort on Delta with yeah. uh, extra leg room. And a little more recline. Uh, yeah, actually. but you know what? They put me on an aisle seat. <gasps> okay. And I don't, I don't know whether to go back to my other mm -hmm. seat. So I'll tell. I used to be a window seater, but I am forever an aisle seater. Are now. you? But aren't you bugged? Do people try to get by you? So my magic seat is the aisle of the middle section. That's where I am. Because there's always another way for the middle people to get out, and that's the if you're least. Sleeping. And those two middle seats in the middle section 
nobody wants to sit there. <laughs> so, so I am always one row back from the bulkhead. So it's like 12G yeah, is my yeah. sweet spot. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I'll keep my seat. I'm still hoping to get bumped up to first first. Yes. I saw that there was a the Also, now that ability. they have those wings that, yeah, you that's know, nice. those help a lot. But I never, yeah. I never travel without a neck pillow, a blow up neck pillow. See, those never worked for me. Oh, they do. They're perfect yeah. for me. Okay. Adventure. We've established that. You're passing that great gene on to your kids. Mm-hmm which is awesome. Let's talk about what you're doing this summer because you've got a pretty big adventure mm-hmm. going on. Yeah. Sail like a girl. Right. Tell me about what the heck that is. Exactly. I grew up on this island and four of my best friends were four guys. I did everything with the guys. Do you have siblings? I have a sister. Yeah. So she's the one who lives in Puerto Rico and we're, oh, okay. we're best friends. She's two and a half years younger, but I call her my big sister because she's taller and she just seems to always have done things kind of you know, like an adult one. (laughs) Um, So I grew up with these four boys as my best friends. I had girlfriends too, but I really was doing a lot of stuff with the boys. I was always water skiing with the boys, snow skiing with the boys. And I, to this day, we have an annual trip to water ski together in Eastern Washington. And, and when I got married in Georgia, two of the four came to the wedding in Georgia. So, so I've done, I've always really wanted to challenge and push myself, whether it was water skiing or snow skiing. um, Or rollerblading. Or rollerblading. Yes. That's funny. Right. And and I'll just for listeners, I read this also about you that there's a, um, there's a path on Bainbridge Island called the Chili Hill. Well, it's actually, so it's a, it's a race every year. So it's a famous bike race. And it just happened a couple weeks ago. Right. So it's every February when the weather's delightful. (laughs) And so when I was in high school, I got up one morning and I used, it was into rollerblading, right? And that was very popular at the time. And I decided I was in Winslow and I decided I'd start rollerblading the course. It's a, I can't remember. It's like 28 miles, I think. And people said, are you, are you doing the chili hilly? And I, no, no, no. I'm just gonna, you know, do part of it. And then I did more of it and more of it. And by, before I knew it, I'd done half of it. And I called my dad from a payphone back in the day when he was, pay phone still and said, dad, he, he was working. He was, must've been in the city. And I said, my, my mom, I think was in Russia at the time. And I said, I'm, I'm doing the chili hilly. And he said, Oh wow. Did you, so you borrowed my bicycle? I said, no. He said, well, where did you get a bicycle? <laughs> I said, I, I didn't. He said, well, Allison, it's a bike race. I said, I know, but I, I have my rollerblades. <laughs> he said, are you crazy? I said, well, I'm just going to do half of it. But of course, once I did half of it, yeah, I couldn't stop. So I did the whole thing and I got back to Winslow after I think five hours. I don't know how long. And there's a lot of hills. So mm-hmm. that's yeah, chilly, hilly. Yeah. So, you know, and rollerblades have these rubber stoppers in the back. I had no rubber left. I was just sparking down the hills <laughs> on this screw that was left. So how so, old were you then? I think I was 16. Oh, I love it. So I, I think, you know, that's kind of in the vein of that. So is that, you know, I think I did my first 10 K decided to do it the night before when I was maybe 10 or 11 and did it the next day. 10 K run. Yeah. And not that I'm a big runner. I'm not, but it was it, those types of things that, you know, I, I haven't been a person who really prepared for these types of things. And but that hasn't stopped no, you. No. And, and I think sometimes the less you know about it, the better. Yeah, I agree. You know, there's a safety there factor is, too. Well, but... I know there's, ig- there's, there is bliss in the ignorance <laughs> right. for sure. Right. Yeah. And so, so this opportunity came up and growing up, one of my first loves was windsurfing and it was the first thing I bought as a child. I saved up all my money and my parents helped me go through the wanted ads and we drove over to Lake Sammamish and I bought a windsurfer. I still have it. My kids play on it and I don't, you know, it's missing pieces, but we use the board and I just was, I loved the wind and I loved to be out there by myself. And I was never a great windsurfer, but it just got out and I would zigzag back and forth. And in the beginning, of course, I wasn't getting back to where I started. My parents would wait till they couldn't see me and then they'd come tow me home. I just loved it. And then I, I did some sailing as a kid. And I think throughout... Did your family have a sailboat? No, we, we were water skiers and snow skiers. We didn't have a sail. We had... We, we had my, my sister and I took sailing lessons and we sailed lasers and our friends had sailboats. So we sailed on other people's boats, but we didn't have our own. And then I lived in places, you know, where it just wasn't available. Not a lot of sailing in Nova Sibirsk, Siberia. Um and I lived in DC and I just didn't know, I didn't have access to a sailboat. And, but it was one of those things that I really kept thinking about and regretting that I didn't get to, I didn't become a better sailor. I didn't get to that point where I, I knew on a bigger boat, 
my way around as well as I wanted to. So, you know, you have, I had children and I was consumed with, you know, they were young and I, working in grad school and research and work and you sort of, I hadn't had an adventure. I, my work is an adventure. I think it's always that, that my lifestyle is an adventure, but I hadn't done a physical, mental adventure in a while. And that I felt was kind of sucking the life out of me that I hadn't done it. I needed it. I really needed it. When did you make that decision? When I heard, when I, when did I realize it? I think was, I realized it when my friend, my dear friend, Jean last fall mentioned that she was going to put a team together. This was this really race. recently. Yeah. I think it was in November. Mm-hmm. I got back from a trip and she said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a team together to sail in this. It's, it's, it's an adventure race. It's not a, not a classical sailing sail race. It's, it's, it's an adventure race. The rules are no motor, no support. And you have to get from Port Townsend to Ketchikan. It's called mm-hmm. Race to Alaska. <laughs> and she said... How many miles is that? 750. She said, you know, she's a, a, a fabulous sailor and she's been sailing for years and her, her husband is as well. But one of the things that always bothered her is she said, even when I double hand with my husband and we come into the dock, the men always ask him the questions. They don't ask me the questions. They don't address them to me. And she and I hit it off when we first met. We had a lot in common. And I think in in spirit wise, we're spirit sisters. So when I heard her mention it, I thought, God, I I wish that's something I so have to do. But I initially thought, Joe, she must, but she's going to be pulling together a team of expert sailors for this. And as we talked more and more and I realized, no, you know, this is something that I, she would consider me for, you know, it's not just sailing because you have to row and bike and, and it's, you know, a lot of sailors would say no to this because it's, it's not really what they normally do. Why do you have to row and bike also? So you have to remove the engine from your boat. And of course, like a sailing race, you don't use your engine, right? However, you, you may use it. For example, going into Victoria, you have to, so the race goes, you have to motor in. So how are you going to, and you can't sail into Victoria. So somehow you have to get there. And also, so for example, so you have to have propulsion systems. Last year on this race, they had about 63 hours with no wind. So did they sit? No, you mean, no. or they just you pedal they, and row. So wait, what do you mean pedal? So you build pedal drives. So we're building, people come up with different ways of doing it. And basically you modify your boat I see. to be able to, pedal it. So we'll have essentially bikes off the back of our boat with propellers that we will be pedaling <laughs> our 32 foot <laughs> sailboat. Hopefully we'll be sailing. Yeah. But for those moments when we can't sail, yeah, we I will see. have oars. And so when you say uh, you're, you, you have to also bike, it's not right. getting out at no, Victoria no. and going pedal. to Bajart right. Gardens. So I'll say and, pedal. We yeah. have to pedal our okay. sailboat, which isn't something that that you'd usually do in a, mm-hmm. in a race. Okay. <laughs> so this is why it's an adventure race. It's an adventure race. I see. And it's unpredictable. You know, there may be no wind. There may be a ton of wind. There may be a gale. Who knows? And there are people that do this in all types of crafts. Um, it's been done on a stand-up paddleboard this year. There's a man doing it supine on a paddleboard. So he will be paddling with his arms uh-huh. all the way to Alaska. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit crazy. 750 miles. Right. And Ooh. so our boat is small. It's 32 foot. It's really a race boat. It's a day racer. It's not intended to be slept on really. It has, it has no head. And so there's no toilet on board and there's no galley. You can't stand up inside. And how many on your team? Eight. <laughs> Eight. <laughs> or, do you have the biggest team? You know, I think right now we do have the biggest team. It, why eight? Today was actually, or yesterday, the 15th, I think was the deadline for registering. Well, we thought, you know, we could go with six, but we really wanted to have eight on board, eight on the team. And it's to be able to rotate. We're going to go day and night and we can't sleep four people down below deck, but we could probably sleep two, sort of, but the sleep will be interesting. So for listeners, uh, they may want to go back to uh, an episode that I did with Megan Mm -hmm. Bigging, who rode in a two person boat from Monterey, California to Honolulu, Hawaii. And I know it's completely different. (laughs) 
but it, I think that'll give people an idea because I'm totally new to this. I'm right. like, I just, I was so in shock about what she was telling me about that particular trip, but it's, it, I think that there's some Definitely. similarities to and it. I listened to that and I've watched also this a film about four women who rode from San Francisco to Australia called Losing Sight of Shore. And I think, you know, I've, we've also met with other ocean ro- rowers to talk about what are the biggest challenges? What did you really not expect? What surprised you? What they, what do they tell you? Often, you know, two, a couple of words of advice. One was personal hygiene. <laughs> it's challenging. Bring the, yeah. bring the deodorant. Yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah. these, you know, special wipes and, and just keep yourself clean. Um, that was their, like one piece of important advice. Provisioning. Provisioning is, is challenging, right? For something that you don't Especially know. Especially with eight, how long, right? right? With eight of you. And for us, you know, we're allowed to stop and buy stuff if we need to. We can't have part of the races, you can't have stuff prepositioned and you can't arrange to have something dropped. But if it's available to everybody, then you can access it. So you could stop at a store. We could get more water if we needed to. If you're sailing across the you know Pacific, it's a little different. You don't have they, yeah, right. And they have water filtration systems. We won't have a water filtration system, we'll carry water with us. But I think also team dynamics, and that's one of the big challenges, and that's where so much of it is mental too. And that is something I really am also excited about working through. I, I do a lot of my work alone, I, and it's been so long since I've done something with a team. And I don't want to say I do my work alone. I work with a team, but it's a remote. You know, the people I work with are all over the world, and 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 we come together and we come apart, we come together. So this is really an intense and I do, you know, it's funny because I, I think I'm not someone who likes to be alone, but I'm also someone who doesn't really always love being in a big group. I don't know what that means, but I think, you know, eight women is a real, it'll be a challenge, a wonderful challenge. Mm-hmm. And I think, do you know all, all the ladies? Yeah, we all know each other, but we all come, we didn't know each other before. So, and that's been really fun too, is finding eight women who have that same craziness. Because it, that's what really brings us together. We're so different, but we all are a little bit, we all have that adventure spirit that's a little quirky and a little different than most of the people we know. So I think that is what bonds us because like I said, there's a lot of people who have great skills who would never do this, but we're all just crazy enough. How many days is it? We don't know. <laughs> so, you know, what would we like? Uh, we'd like to do it in less than a week. But there's, you know, some of the We're other... not talking months. <laughs> no. And I, you know, the other women's teams that have done it in the past, there's been two. And I think it was about 12 days. Only two other teams. Women two other teams. all-female teams. And I'm not aware of any other all-female team this year. I think we may be the only. And so we actually, we won a video contest to get some sponsorship. So there'll be some videos made of us. Great. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's the whole process because we began with, you know, getting the boat and, and then we stripped the boat down completely ourselves and really put it all back together. So it was, we had the kids involved and our husbands drove down to California and got the boat and we you know, really did all this work on it ourselves. And, and now we're out on the water three to four days a week. Wow. Uh, rain or shine, all, hail, are, wind. <laughs> are all the other ladies on Bainbridge? No. So four of us are on the island. So it's kind of, we're split between the city. Okay. And, and, but we keep the boat on the island and we, we are out this weekend. Saturday was pretty wet. Um, Sunday was better. So we're out as much as we can be. But in addition to the practicing, working as a team, there's, like I said, you know, we're freeze drying food and we're trying to get sponsorship and we're doing interviews and holding fundraising events. So it's been in our family, it's, you know, our families have come together that, you know, we, three of us have kids in the same grade at school. And so that their teachers are, are excited. The kids are going to follow us. Oh, it's fun. And so it's been fun to see also, you know, the support that our families, again, my, my family's been incredibly supportive. My parents. What's the date of it? Supportive. So we leave from Port Townsend on June 14th. And then we sail to Victoria. And that's the only stop, really. You stop in Victoria, and then you leave from Victoria on on Sunday. Do you have to stop in there for uh, for customs purposes? Well, we stop in for that. But we also, they do a lot of, there's some mandatory meetings of everyone, like safety. And then there's press stuff and Mm -hmm. a party. And and then the big send-off. Yeah, good. So, yeah. Is is, is Victoria a one-day trip then? Right. So, we'll we'll leave from Port Townsend around 5 a.m., 
and we should be there that evening. And Great. And you'll have long days at that right, point, right. too. It's so June. Yeah. So you can leave so, it. Yeah. yeah you time. can leave at yeah. five. And, and so this is really, you know, it's it's an adventure. What a great example for your kids. Yeah, it's fun. I think, again, that's something that I'm very conscious of, too, is is challenging myself and seeing them, having them see me do something that, you know, might have, might be a little scary. And your husband is supportive. Oh, very Super uh-huh. supportive. Yeah. And I keep thanking him because, you know, I travel a lot and that's the hard thing because I'm gone. And I think some people thought oh, you're gone already and now you're doing this. But this, you know, I just, I was in a position, I had a, you know, a very challenging last, the last two years of, have, I've been through a lot the last two years. And I, you know, I realized I really need to do something for myself. And I was starting to feel myself being beaten down when I made this decision to do it and, and things have turned around and I'm in a a stronger place right now, but I think I was at a, in a low spot and I realized I really need to prove to myself again, that I have the strength, physical and mental strength to do something like this. Is this is the last two years? Is that not part of, well, it's part of the reason why it's how I found out about you. Is that what you're talking about specifically? So let's dive into that and and talk about what's been going on for the last couple of years. And it's a coincidence because today is April 16th. It is. And that was the day I flew two years ago. No kidding. I didn't even think about it until right now. Yeah. Well, what happened two years ago today? Um, So two years ago today, I was headed to... Kenya, but I was actually going to Uganda first to visit our, the women we work with there and, and visit the cancer center. And I was sexually assaulted on the flight from Seattle to Amsterdam. I was groped. And this was, you know, I fly and I've been flying a ton for years and I had never, ever thought about this. I traveled solo. I, my husband and I always talk about our situational awareness and I'm, I'm quite aware and I've you know, done some other traveling where I've consciously, I'm always thinking about my awareness and being very, very, I'm very conscious about it. I never thought about it on an airplane. The airplane was sort of that safe spot where I got on. I don't really talk to people when I get on the plane. I just put my headphones on. I watch a movie. I go to sleep because I need to be able to work when I land. And if I've got back to back nine hour flights, I just, I'm going to get that sleep so that when I land, I'm ready to work. So I was completely shocked. And as I started to look into this, because I, I wanted to follow up with the airline to find out how, you know, it, it was not handled well. And I'll just say too, I'll, I'll just say, we, right. don't, we don't need to go into the yeah. details here. Yeah. Um, so I won't even ask right. about it because I think that's irrelevant, right. but people can find it online. Yeah. So that's, Thank you. that's fine. Right. But let's talk about right. kind what's of happened. what's happened yeah. since. So, so like I said, I was so shocked, but as I started to look into it and I found a, a lot of news articles about people being assaulted on flights, yet I couldn't find any data. And as someone who works in public health, I really mm-hmm. wanted to find the data, how often, and, and it wasn't there. But what I did find was mention of a bill that was proposed by a congresswoman, Eleanor Holmes Norton in 2014, calling for data collection for airlines to report this to, to and then the bill disappeared. It had bipartisan support and then it was gone. And I, you know, started trying to figure out what can I do? And I... And as someone too, I want to point out that as someone who has been an advocate for women for years, this almost came naturally. I'm I'm assuming this almost came naturally to you. I mean, it kind of made sense because you have this, this is already in your DNA of like, this is my world. I'm helping women (laughs) and this is a new problem. So let me figure out how to fix it. I, uh, my friends, uh, am I allowed to say um, one of the joke nicknames I, I had? younger was the, the clusterfuck buster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you can say that. I find problems and I try to solve them. Yeah, good. And so this seemed like, I thought this is something, this seems like a no brainer. I can't believe nothing's been done about this. So I reached out to Patty Murray's office. In the meantime, I created a Facebook page because I wanted a place to store these stories of other women and, and a man or two, but there were a few men, but mostly it was women. And I wanted a place to store them. And I wanted to start to raise awareness, not to scare people, but to make them aware. And I think if you raise awareness, it also can become a deterrent. So I then started 
I wrote, I wrote my story down for myself to try to, to think through it. And I started to think about what could be done. And I reached out to Patty Murray's office. Our because, senator. Yes, mm-hmm. Senator Patty Murray's office. Because I really initially wanted help trying to figure out what had happened to that bill. And th- her office was amazing. And they started looking into it. And they were quite surprised too. And we worked over the summer. And I wrote an op-ed. I started sending it out, but nobody nobody paid attention. I, I sent the op-ed to a lot of places. And, and I'm a writer, so I'm going to brag a little bit. I can write well. and But nobody was interested. Nobody bit. Until the fall, in October, if you'll recall. This is 2016 2016, now. then candidate Trump was accused of groping a woman on a flight in the 70s. So Jessica Lee's story came out. And I got a call from the New York Times. So they wanted to interview me. And so that was... How did they find you? Um, you know, I... Two ways. I'm not sure. So I'd sent them both. I'd sent them an op-ed, but I had also... I had the Facebook page at that point. So I answered some questions, but I, it really wasn't the story I wanted to tell. They wanted to focus on what could women do to prevent it. And my point was, it's not about what women can do to prevent it. It's we need to change the way people behave and we need to change the environment and how it's ad- addressed. So I kept pushing and right, right after that, on October 31st, I got a letter from, from Patty Murray, an email and and this letter that was signed by 23 senators calling, it was a letter to the department, to, to the department of transportation and the FAA saying, we need to look into this. And it had my story in the letter. And that just, I actually, I, kind of, I cheered up a bit. I, I was at a meeting in Paris and I got that. It just hit me and I thought, wow, like this might actually move forward. And then the election happened and my husband and I were in Barcelona when the election happened and it just sort of crushed me. And I thought, well, maybe now nothing's going to happen because there's a lot of, a lot of, we're going to be fighting a lot of fights moving forward. But I, so I decided right then too, that I need, as soon as the March, the women's March was announced, I decided I had to be there. So I flew to DC in January for the women's March with some of my closest girlfriends and we met up from different places. And I also set up some meetings. So I went to meet with the Association of Flight Attendants. And I had reached out to them in the summer previously because I thought, if I'm going to pursue this, this really is a, the, the flight crew and the flight attendants specifically are on the front lines of this. And they are, they are assaulted in their job. So I wanted to be sure that- Also, what, no statistics on that. Right. It's very, Yeah. So I wanted to be sure that I had found my stakeholders and and all the people that were involved in this issue. So I had developed a good relationship with with the Association of Flight Attendants. They're great. And I met with them and I also met with Patty Murray's staff and and did an interview with BBC while I was there and things started to move forward. But, you know, it would sort of come and go in waves. There'd be a lot of action and then it would die off for a while. And then there'd be a lot of action and then it would die off for a while. And there'd be another story and Condé Nast did a story. And, um, and meanwhile, you know, I'm traveling for work and I have my job and, and I am having anxiety attacks uh, while packing or on a plane. And this is starting to impact the way I work. Because you were afraid it would happen again. And, you know, it, it's hard to say whether I thought it any, it would get to something around flying and I just would have these anxiety attacks. I, I don't know if it's that I thought it would happen again, but it was the stress around flying. And also I was sort of thrown into the media with an issue that's not a fun issue to talk about. And there are people come out of the woodwork to say nasty things about you. And where were you seeing that? In, you know, I would Google my name and there for a while, the first thing that popped up was this woman who said she knew me personally and I was a manipulative liar <laughs> who would do anything to get what I wanted. And I just couldn't believe it. You know, I don't know this woman. And why would she pick on me? How did she even find this? And why does she care? And that was hard. And I learned people said never read the comments. But, you know, I, sometimes I would just peek and... Yeah, then you get sucked then you in. get sucked into this hole, and I am good at it now. I don't. But that was hard because I thought, you know, I'm trying to fix something here. And why, why are the airlines so reluctant to do the right thing? Because I found an article from 1998. It was a Washington Wall Street Journal article. And the airlines met to discuss the rise of sexual misconduct. On 1998. 1998. And I thought, okay, it's now it's been 20 years. This is ridiculous. And meanwhile, as I'm doing this, 
articles are just popping up about about minors being assaulted on planes and the stories that you just couldn't believe unless it's happened to you. And as I started to hear these other women's stories and, and women started to reach out to me through the Facebook page and say, I don't know what to do. This happened to me. And so many of these similar stories and so many similar reactions from the airlines, basically brushing it off, not reporting it. Then when women complain saying, sorry for the inconvenience, you know, here's 2000 miles, here's 10, you know, 10,000 miles, here's 7,000 miles. That I think was one of the most insulting things was to have them say, sorry for the inconvenience. Here's 10,000 miles. And I wanted to just, I, I just couldn't believe that that's the response that I got and that they wouldn't take it seriously. And I think not being taken seriously was, was just a really, was, was what really lit a fire for me to, you know, do something. And if it had been handled differently, you may not have had that same anxiety right. before right. flying yeah. again, just the the trauma of not yeah. being taken seriously. And I think as someone who's always felt very, well, in my adult life, very confident and comfortable traveling, it really hurt to have this, to have this insecurity, to have this anxiety. It wasn't who I wanted to be. And I kept, but I kept pushing and, and I always think about what inspires me. And I think, of course, there's the obvious, the people who come up and say, I think you can make a difference. When someone says, I think you can make a difference, you know, that's so, that gives you so much fuel to go forward. And there were a few people early on who said, you know, one person said to me when he was taking my, my, my story for the report, he said, you know, I've seen way too many of these, but I think for some reason you might be someone who might actually do something about it. And I don't know, you know, what it was at that moment that he, why he said that to me, but I, that stuck in my head. I was like, well, maybe, you know, I need to do something. And I have a good friend who always said, if you have, if you have the opportunity and the ability, you have the obligation. Mm -hmm. And so that sticks in my head too. And I thought, I really, I need to do something about this. So, you know, it's been two years, but in that two years, I've, you know, I've heard so many stories. Um, the ones about the children is really, those are the hardest. And you know, I've, I've thought about it, like, because I am also, when you talk about kind of that situational awareness, yeah. I grew up in New Jersey, I spent a lot of time in New York. And so and I feel like that was an in, innate mm -hmm. thing, because I was like a, just a street savvy, yeah. you know, just I had different smarts than somebody growing up in Iowa, right. let's say who didn't have to worry about that right. kind of thing. So I've always been aware of that. And when I get on a plane, I actually do think of that. And it is something that I'm concerned about. And I have thought about, but I had never heard any kind of statistics. Yeah. Right. Like you said, exactly. I've, no one has ever publicly complained mm -hmm. about it or told me a story. I hear stories about hotels right. and about other things, but I, I've never heard about something that's happening on a plane. And so I don't know, I don't know how I initially came across your story, but somehow your story came up and I thought, wow, someone's actually talking about this because I hadn't yeah. ever seen that before. Well, that's two, what two, one is like I said, so I've always prided myself in my sort of street savviness. And so that really, so this was one of those, it hit me right in that spot where I thought that I was, this was my strength and they got me. But the other issue is the stigma. And I realized a big parallel between my work in breast cancer and sexual assault. And there's stigma in both. And and right now when we see a lot of talk about the Me Too campaign and a credit given to the Me Too campaign saying, well, finally women are coming forward. And, and that bothers me too, because I want to remind people that it's not that people are finally coming forward. It's that people are finally listening because women have been coming forward and telling their stories, maybe more coming forward now, but no, I think really it's people are being forced to hear them. Well, just think about Bill Cosby, right? How many years ago? Right. Like, I mean, so re many recent stories history. like that, right? People and knew they just chose not to listen. So, and, and, and there's these other parallels. So with breast cancer and with sexual assault in other countries, when I work with women, often they don't come forward because they don't believe anything will be done. And same with sexual assault. People don't believe anyone, anything will be done. They won't be taken seriously. But let's say they do report it. What's the response? You did something wrong to have this happen to you. With breast cancer, they'll be told, you know, you didn't exercise or you, um, you know, you did, you were cursed. This is something because you did something wrong. And with sexual assault, you know, there's something you did to bring this upon yourself. But let's say you get past it. 
I talk to breast cancer survivors who are accused of being liars because in countries they live in, they say, oh, people don't survive cancer. So who's paying you to say you're a survivor? Whereas in sexual assault too, once you come through it, you're often, you're the, if you, if you're trying to pursue it as an advocate, you're kind of seen as a troublemaker and, or you're trying to take somebody down. And so there's this, this thread of stigma that runs through both of those that I saw, you know, as parallels. And as I'm working with these breast cancer survivors who are in, in working in countries where it's not, the advocacy movement is not like here. They're not celebrated. You know, there isn't a big party to celebrate survivorship. They are stigmatized and they, they're not supported and they're working against all odds to improve care for women in their country. So how could I, as someone who's there trying to support them in their advocacy efforts and help them? And, and really what we're doing is I can't tell them what works in their country. You know, that's up to them. But what I can do is say, based on the resources available in your country, these are some viable solutions. These are where you should target your efforts to focus on pathology. Or, this is so what has worked in other this countries is what, or other... Right. And this is what works. In, and given the gaps in your system, this is probably the best place to put your advocacy efforts. So how could I be there, you know, sort of supporting them and telling them this is what you should do and not be doing it in my own life? So that was really, again, a motivator and what kept pushing me forward. And again, in the breast cancer work that we do, the progress is so slow. We're not going to see outcomes of the work we do for years. But I was doing this other work with the air, airline issue and I was seeing it move relatively quickly and it sort of gave me that fuel. And I always tell people, if you're, if you're in this type of work where, you know, it's the long, it's the marathon, right? You need to also think of those little wins. And so I'm not, I've never done a marathon, I'm not a runner, but I imagine each mile is a little win. So for me, this, the airline issue is one of those little wins that fuels me for that marathon, that breast cancer work that I may not see changes for 20 years. Uh, so, it, so you have a, you have a yeah. lawsuit right now going, yes, is that correct? I do. But, but aside from that, I wanted to talk about before, you know, I want to talk about the, the legislation and what Patty Murray did. And so working with Patty Murray in her office she drafted and, and with Senator Casey, what's called the SAFE Act, the Stopping Assault While Flying Enforcement Act. So that was introduced in the Senate last summer. And I was thrilled. But again, you know, a, 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 a bill on its own doesn't necessarily have a good chance of getting through. So it was great. I was excited about it. But at the same time, you know, I thought so and what that was calling for was a creation of a task force to review policies and procedures and then the development of protocols and training, and data collection. So those were all the things I wanted. The one thing that's not there that I really still want included is a message in the in-flight video or the safety card that sort of says, you know, we have a zero tolerance policy against assaulting passengers and crew, and there's consequences. You know, we tell people not to tamper with a smoke detector. I'd love to see the data on how many people tamper (laughs) with a smoke detector against the data on how many people get assaulted, but we don't know because we don't have good data. So hopefully going forward, what we do know, the only thing we do know is that there's been a 66% increase in cases opened by the FBI in the two, last two years. And the, and it's, uh, the FBI is the overseeing authority right. because it's flight. Right? Because, because of it's, jurisdiction. It, it, right. it changes mm-hmm. jurisdictions. And in mm-hmm. my case, it's tricky because I fall under the Montreal Convention because it's an international flight. So that's a whole nother ball of wax and it's too complicated to get into. But it, 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 it's different than if it were to be a domestic flight. So I think, um, you know, so that eventually we'll have, have some data this so but like I said the bill was introduced and then you know things went quiet again until fall and it was really around both I think the increase of press around me too and uh Randy Zuckerberg making a statement about being a, a harassed on a flight and Randy Zuckerberg is the sister of Mark Zucker, of, Zuckerberg, yeah Facebook right. CEO Zuck, Mark yeah Zuckerberg right so she was she had an experience on a flight and she, she wrote about it and that sort of also piqued interest and, and I got a lot more attention and did a lot more interviews. And then I, what recently happened now, I'm proud to say that it's actually a law because Patty Murray's office and Patty Murray put that language into the omnibus bill. So she actually called me in Zambia just recently when I was there to give me the good news to say, 
We just passed, it just passed the house. We're going to pass it through the Senate tonight. It's going to get signed and it's going to be a law. And she said, I said to her, you know, I'm actually in Zambia right now working with advocates. And she said to me, don't let anyone ever tell you that one person can't make a difference and share that with the advocates. Oh gosh, that's great. For me, it was, you know, kind of also this vindication of, I actually can do what I am saying I can do. You know, I, I can advocate for something. And I think equally, like I said, there's the motivation of people who saying they believe in you, but I've also always been motivated by the people who didn't believe in me. And I see that instead as an opportunity to change the way people think, because whether it was going to Siberia at 17, when the guidance counselor thought that that was a terrible idea and said, I'd learn nothing, um, and coming back speaking Russian <laughs> to, um, you know, all these things. Well, you know, coming back and speaking Russian <laughs> and then changing the trajectory of your life right, based exactly. on that experience right. too. All and, that. and then the, the, the lives that you have changed because of that experience yeah. at 17 too. And, you know, I took high school kids to Siberia for years and we used to do an exercise with them. I love it. It's called the albatross exercise. And it's really about challenging their perceptions and, and, helping them be cognizant of the fact that they look of the lenses through which they look at the world. And I remember being in a store in Moscow with the kids and, and a lot of this has changed now, but it used to be in the Soviet period. And and right after that, when you went into grocery stores or stores, you uh, went to one spot and you sort of identified the item you wanted, you got a ticket, then you went to a place and you paid for it and then you picked it up. And so I, I would always, there were a few stores that were still like that. And I would take the kids in and they got so frustrated. They said, this is so inefficient. Like, why, this is ridiculous. Why do, and I said, well, what is your, what do you, what is your objective? Like, what is your end goal? And they said, their goal was efficiency. They prized efficiency. And I said, well, what if instead your goal was to have hundred percent employment, right? And then they thought, oh, wow. I said, so create more jobs. Efficiency wasn't the goal. Employment was the goal. So getting people to step back and, and I think it's hard people, you, don't always do that. And that's sort of one of the things that motivates me is really getting people to stop and think and, and, and to challenge their assumptions. And that's been something for me always, whether it was when I was, you know, working in East Mediterranean, like in Turkey, and and when I was, you know, with, with health, with global health, with breast cancer, I think there's global health grew up around infectious disease and, epidemics and there's so much attention put to HIV and AIDS and malaria and TB and and that's needed there's a huge need for it but as there's been this shift there's a shift so we've had a 40% uh, reduction in maternal mortality since 1990 which means you have a lot more women that are living longer which is fabulous and a product of that success is they're living longer and they are now getting diseases like cervical cancer, breast cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And so those health systems have to adjust. Yet still, when we look at how resources are allocated, whether they're um, donations or international funding, you see, and this is my visual, right? Here's all this money, this giant bar of resources going to HIV AIDS. And then the burden is this little bar. And then that is equal to the money going for cancer. And then this big bar is the burden. So you know, more people are dying from cancer in Africa than from malaria, but you don't hear about that. And so I think um, I, it's that, trying to get people to to challenge the thoughts that they have and, and what the, the way they think and, and to see, you know, something they may not know about. Sorry. So to get back to yeah, the, to, that's okay. Uh, to, get, so, to get back to the, you said it is now law. Yeah. The, what what is law so, and what does that mean? How is it enforceable? Right. So so it's and congratulations. Thank by you. <laughs> so it's yet to be. You know, this is new. This just happened. The omnibus bill passed. You know, just what two weeks ago. So in the law, there has to be a task force created. So that's the first step. And then within a year, there needs to be protocols and training within the airlines within the airlines across the industry. So, and again, I've always said, like, this is not a specific airlines problem. This is an industry-wide problem. And, you know, airlines need to give their crew the tools to handle the situation appropriately. They can't, you cannot expect them to handle this appropriately if they've never been giving training and there's not protocols. So, and that's been the problem. You know what, even if you don't have training in it, if there's no protocol, that's the issue. Because Mm -hmm. if you're a, if you're a strong flight attendant and you've just 
your ass has just been pinched or, yeah. su- or, or you've been assaulted, you can be strong and you can stand up for yourself. But then what? Yeah. And Do it, you, d- does the plane come down at the, at the next mm-hmm. airfield? Does that, do, you know, are police called and that person is picked up? you know, upon departure, like, what is it? What happens? You yeah. Know? So, and that has to be clarified for everyone. Right. And I think that's been part of the problem. It's been very murky. So now hopefully that will change. And, you know, just last week when I was on vacation in one week, I had five people reach out to me with story, with asking for help and guidance and saying this happened to me. And that's just, you know, the numbers keep going up. And Did you ever try to reach out to any, um, Bud men's, um, is that right? Ombudsman's? Yeah. Ombudsman. Ombudsman. You mean, um, in like, so like, For a, help. like well, a university has an ombudsman. No, ombudsman well, what I'm thinking is like, that Christopher Elliott, he, I, I'm not sure who exactly he is with at the moment, but he has worked for um, Traveler's Rights for oh, a long time. So yeah, I did reach out to Traveler's Rights and I do, or no, not uh, Flyer's Rights, Traveler, Flyer's Rights. I know he's not with them. Okay. I know he was with National Geographic okay. for a long time. I think he was with yeah. USA USA Today for okay. a long time. But the reason I ask is that, it, uh, and no slam on him because uh, because I know him. and yeah. he's a great guy and he's doing great work. But I just wonder because he's because he's a male, maybe he doesn't know what to do with that kind of information. Yeah, like you're the perfect <laughs> advocate for it. And I think, uh, well, thank you. And like I said, you know, I, I, I hope not to be remembered for what happened to me, but for the fact that now there will be a way to deal with it better. I did, and I have connected, and honestly, I can't remember the names of all of the people and organizations. I kind of took my advocacy toolkit in my head that I used to train with and said, okay, where are the stakeholders? And I went out and mapped, you know, stakeholders. And then I started reaching out to them. And some people responded, some didn't. And again, like I said, this was something I was doing in addition to my job and my life. So I always would say to people, this is just sort of a hobby right now where I'm, I'm trying to, so it had loopholes and I missed things. I know I missed things along the way. Um, but so I, I can't remember all of the different mm-hmm. groups that I connected with. Okay. Some of them just sort curious. of solidified more. And I think it's really been the Association of Flight Attendants um, and Patty Murray's staff that I've kind of ended up really being in the most contact with. Well, I just, uh, I, I just think, uh, you are in the like, such a great position to have been the person to you know to come forward to make this happen. You know, and guess if it had to happen ways. to someone, <laughs> well, true, but but also then to yeah. have you know to be in Washington State and to have Senator Murray's support. Right. You know, all of these things. Right, just everything kind of sort came of lined together. up. Yeah, it sure did. And yeah. and again, like I said, it it really as someone who's always had very high situational awareness. As you know, I mentioned that I I solo traveled not intentionally it was really by accident from from Georgia to the south of France to meet my parents because I couldn't get on a flight and I kept thinking well I'll get to the next airport and I'll get a flight and I'll get to the next city and I'll catch a flight and before I knew it it was six days later and I had just gotten there by (laughs) land you know and all along I was traveling I had my backpack with my computer I had my I had a suitcase I had a rolling duffel it was not travel I was not traveling light (laughs) and you know I I got a ride I walked across the border into Turkey at, at 10 o'clock at night and hitched a ride to, to Hopa and then took a bus to Trabzon thinking I'd catch a plane, but it, I thought I'm not safe getting off of this at 12 o'clock at night. So I'll just ride the bus till it's light out. And I got off at Samson. Okay. I'll figure out from Samson. From Samson, I got to Ankara. I thought, well, I'll catch a plane. No, I'll keep going. I got to Izmir, you know, ended up in someone's house that night, they, not for dinner, but to get a ride to another place to catch a boat that didn't leave two nights on a boat, sleeping on the deck, the only female on the deck and the only American on the deck, you know, trying to also negotiate what do you do if you have to sleep? So it means you don't sleep, right? I'm like, okay, I won't sleep at night. I ended up in the bridge of the ship and they taught me um, navigation. (laughs) And I thought, you know, they have to work all night. So if I stay up here, I can just drink coffee and sleep during the day. And then to a train and ended up getting picked, getting a ride from the French Formula One racing team. (laughs) <laughs> um, and I was trying to get, we had this, and speaking of adventure, my mother is, 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 she talks to everyone and she had found for us an adopted grandmother. She liked to adopt other people and she adopted, adopted grandma Cheryl because they had seats next to each other at the fifth Avenue or at, I'm not sure which theater, but they had season tickets that were next to each other. Here in Seattle. Yes. And, and she adopted her as, as our grandmother and grandma Cheryl always spent a month in the South of France in September 
and she would invite different people to come stay for a week. And my parents had gone before, and this year they invited me to come too. And, and Grandma Cheryl was just, she'd had an amazing adventure life, an and amazing woman. And so I was trying to get there. And my parents said, well, when you get to Borm, it was Borm Le Mimosa, just call and, and she'll come get you. Well, I did, but when I called, her phone was broken. Mm-hmm. So she couldn't hear me. I could hear her, but she couldn't hear me. And I didn't have the address. My parents just said, call. And so I was stuck. It was Sunday night and I was at the train station in year, and I've come 120 hours. And I am now out pretty much, I think, out of money. And I'm sitting there and everything's closed. And this one guy comes running in and I said, um, do you know how I can get to Borm Lee Mimosa? And he said, well, my cousin lives there and he just dropped me off. I left my wallet in his car. He's coming back. If he makes it in time, I'm jumping on the train and he'll take you. So he, he races up, throws a wallet, looks at me. He's like, you're coming with me? I said, yes. <laughs> so we get in the car and we start driving. We pick up another guy with a bicycle and we drive and I said, you know, we try to call from his cell phone. She, she's now unplugged the phone because I've called so many times. I said, any chance, you know, this woman, she comes here every year, 80 American speaks French. He's like, no. But he said, you know, I'm the chef for the French Formula One racing team and we're having a party. So why don't you, <laughs> why don't you come for dinner and we'll sort it out. And, oh you know, we couldn't God. find her. And, and he said, they said, you know, you can stay, but we're leaving for Portugal in the morning. So they took me to a friend's house. And the next day I ended up going, I said, I'll go to the, I know she gets the um, Herald Tribune every morning. So I went and sat in the square waiting for her to show up. She doesn't show up. So then I'm, I called my sister and she said, mom and dad said there's a bakery in town that knows Grandma Cheryl. So I thought, oh my God, I'm in France. How many bakeries? So I started bakery to bakery. To bakery, to bakery. <laughs> Do you know this? Nobody. In the afternoon, I walked into a bakery and this woman said, oh my gosh, you're still lost. You were in my dad's bakery this morning. So she said, hang on. So she took me next door and we actually called French Telecom and took the phone number worked it backward and we got a street name, but no, no address. They said, and, and it, I walked an hour and a half to get there. And I said, um, I'm walking up and I'm, I'd seen a picture of my parents sitting on the deck or a, a patio. So I was trying to get high enough up the mountain to the vantage point at which I thought they were sitting at. And I just, I was like, I can't figure it out. And then a pool truck comes along, pool repair van jump. I knew the house had a pool. So I jump out and I stop him. And I said, do you know this name? Cause this is the house that, that she's rented. It's the name of the owners. And he said, yes, it's, he points to a driveway. So I walk up this driveway and as I'm walking up, a car pulls in and I thought, Oh, I don't know if I'm in the right place. And the window goes down and my mom leans her head out and says, <laughs> Hey honey. And here she thinks I've just been out for a walk. Cause they haven't heard from me in oh, no. six days. Right. And they think I just arrived just fine because oh, they don't no. know what's happened. And I'm out for a stroll. And I said, no, I just, I'm getting here. Cause I'd left all my stuff in town and walked there. But, um, so that was again one of those. What was your mindset? Were you uh, I was were so, you panicky? Were you frustrated? No, I was so focused that whole trip. You know, it was so I was so focused, and I was always thinking. And this is where I think about travel solo, traveling solo. But you have to be so alert and aware. But it's, you enjoy it, and you I think you talk to a lot more people when you're alone, right? You, yeah, absolutely. You put yourself out there. If you're with someone, people aren't going to talk to you. But if you're alone, you just you do. And I met. I mean, it, it's still, it's such an amazing adventure. I met amazing people, but I was always very attuned to where I was and where my belongings were. So I always had my passport and money tucked in underneath my clothing. And I was always conscious of what I could jump with. So I could jump, I could, what I could leave behind. I could let that go. I could let that go. I'd look at what, what, what did I absolutely have to have? And I never had to do that. Mm. I, but I, I, every moment I thought, okay, if right now I had to jump out of this car and run. I was like, what would the villagers in that house think when I showed up in the middle of the night in Turkey? <laughs> um, but were you, were you, was it stressful for you or were, was no, it more like it an, was adventure, an adventure? Like, oh, I wonder what, I wonder what yeah. would happen. It was just crazy. And the craziest thing happened. Were you? I was 25 and it was September. I, I got there on my birthday, September 4th, 2001. So, right. Mm, yeah. Week later. Right. Um, but you know, and I, I learned to drive that, you know, they showed me how to drive a ship. I had dinner with the crew. I, I was basically wearing my pajamas at that point, which were, you know, like gingham pants and a shirt, but I had dinner with the crew and they were all in their whites. And I remember sitting at their private table because <laughs> they just, people were so shocked. They just couldn't believe that what I was doing. They're like, what? You're alone as a female and you're doing what? 
where are you going? And I don't know. I had read the book. There's a book called Eastward Toward Tatari. Don't know it. It's a great book. And it's about traveling that route the other direction. So basically going from France east, and, and he writes about how it gets more challenging. But actually for me, you know, being in Georgia and Turkey was the easier part because I, you know, I spoke languages. Then I, you know, I could get by in Georgia with my, at the time, basic Georgian and my Russian. And at that time, my Turkish was much better. So I could find in Turkey. And then as I got to Italy, it got trickier for me because I just, I couldn't communicate as as well as I had been able to. And I had French in high school. So in France, I, I it was passable. But you know, it was interesting for me that really where I was most comfortable and I knew how the systems operated was in the East and, and coming West was, was as it made it a little trickier for me, but I still look back at that. And I, you know, I think I was very proud of myself and I think putting yourself out, taking those risks. And again, it wasn't something I planned for. I don't think, I mean, not that I advocate (laughs) not never planning for anything. However, you know, in, in these, these opportunities I've had, they've often presented themselves without a lot of time to plan. And I have sort of gone on the fly. Well, when you have a toolkit yeah, that, al- right. that already has the basics in it, and you know, like the precautions and some, some, some basic safety yeah. things that you need to do, like traveling light, because yeah. the more I always tell people, yeah. the more bags you have, then yeah. you're going to be stumbling around trying, right. to f- trying to fool around with your bags when somebody can easily come pickpocket you. Right. So I realize that, you know, right. that um, you don't have to have all your ducks in a row. I always tell people this. You don't have to right. have your ducks in a row. You just have to have that toolkit and just feel somewhat confident before you take off. And the truth is you can never control what happens to you completely. But what you can control is how you're going to react or how you're going to respond to it. So I think practicing how you respond to situations is really the best you can do. And so putting yourself out there, practicing that. So practicing putting yourself into those little bit uncomfortable, sort of risky places, and then practicing the reaction that you want to have. And that is really, and then of course, there's always those times you're like, oh, I wish I had said this or done that. Well, it's never perfect, is it? You can't make it perfect. But I think those experiences, is what that's what I've learned the most from. Those are the experiences that have shaped me in my life. And so I think the lesson is, yes, you you don't have to be 100% prepared for everything. You can't be. And, and, and understanding that you're never going to be. But you're like you said, building those toolkits. I build toolkits all the time. I build toolkits for advocates. So it's like using those toolkits to help you navigate those environments and those opportunities. Because yeah. they're, that's the thing, too. I think when, when my friend Jean from Sail Like a Girl, when she, when she mentioned this, and I said to my husband, I said, God, it's just eating me away, eating me up. I can't let this go. I, I have to do it. It's, if I don't do this, I'll regret it. And I don't want to do that. So, so I think that's really a lot of it is um, it's challenging yourself, challenging others, and, and, react, and, and practicing those opportunities. Well, this is a great place for me to ask you the question that I ask yeah. everyone, and that is because it's the Be Bold podcast. Yes. Um, what does it mean to you to be bold? I think to be bold is to live in that space. For me, it's about making a difference, about having an impact. And that often means putting yourself in a place where you might be a little bit uncomfortable. But leaving a mark that's going to make something better for someone else. Mm -hmm. So if any way, if I can encourage people to, to, to do something they might not have done, to take that risk... And to know that, just to know that you're going to learn from it. Maybe it'll be hard and it won't be what you wanted it to be. But I think that's it too. It's because you just don't know. But what you do, what does happen is you learn from it. So what is it to be bold? I think it's, it's having an impact and, and taking those risks. I was going to ask, is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to chat about? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I think we covered a lot. I'm trying to remember if there was. What? Well, I asked you a question yeah. oh. and I don't know if you were, you didn't want to answer it yeah. or, the, but, I, but asking about the lawsuit. the lawsuit. Yeah. And I didn't really want to talk about it. I don't know what to say about it. Um, I think initially what I could say is I, um, when this happened to me, I really wanted to pursue, I wanted the airline to do the right thing. 
And I think what I would say about this is that I spent two years trying to get airlines to address this issue. And early on in this, when I brought this issue up, I was told, you know, you might need to to pursue this legally to put the pressure on. And that wasn't what I wanted to do. And I wanted to also demonstrate that I was seeking, pursuing every avenue other than legal to do this. And that was, you know, policy change, awareness, and nothing, nothing was getting the airlines to change. They weren't doing it. So then I did file the lawsuit. When did that get filed? um, Gosh, I want to think. I think it was, it was um, January, February. I don't oh, know this the year, 2018. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, okay. I waited I, I, it, because it, it was really for me the last resort. I get it. I, I'm not a litigious person and I didn't, but I, and I really didn't want to go that route, but I recognized that often that's really the only way to do it. And I really didn't know at that point what was going to happen with the legislation. It didn't look positive at that point. And, and there was a statute of limitations, you know, that was expiring. And so... The interesting thing, though, I realized, too, is when you file a lawsuit, it gets a lot more press. And that was overwhelming. I think the the morning I woke up and I looked and there was a Washington Post article in my Facebook feed and it said like 500 shares and 500 comments. And I had a little anxiety attack right there with my husband. Thought, oh, my God, this is really and, and just there was so much attention. And I, you know, so in that regard, it. it sort of put it in front of people more than I had been able to before. Um, But also, you know, airlines need to do something about this. Well, thank you for answering the question about the lawsuit, because it's helpful for me and I'm sure for listeners to, to, to um, one, know a little bit about your, the, the background with it, that you had tried all these other avenues and it wasn't working. And I think we know that sometimes things don't actually happen until you put that kind of force on it. So thank you um, for that. And also I was curious as to why, when it happened, because it did seem like it happened more recently. I wasn't sure of the date, but now I understand why that it wasn't, Mm -hmm. you weren't coming out guns blazing saying, I'm going to get, get you back. Right. You just wanted legislation changed. And I wanted to be really clear from the beginning that this was not me about trying to, this is not about me trying to get something. Right. Of course. And I don't blame people that file a lawsuit. I'm not meaning to judge people who file a lawsuit right off the bat. You know, that's, it's everyone's own decision, but I really wanted to, to be clear about the fact that I'm seeking change for everybody. I don't want to see this happen. And I want there to be an industry wide change that makes it safer for people to fly and makes it safer for the crews. And something that I've talked about is, you know, when this happens on a plane and if the crew does not have training, it is just, and they're sitting, they take so much time to try to figure out what to do. Whereas think about all the other things they practice. If there's an emergency on a plane, they've practiced it and they know you do this, you do this, you do this. So when someone's assaulted on a plane and they don't have a protocol, it might take five of them standing there talking about it for a long time. To, meanwhile, they're distracted from their job. So instead, if you said, okay, here's a protocol, there's two of you, you do this, this, and this, everyone else can still be doing their job. That actually improves the safety of everyone else on board. And so I think I just was, I was not happy at the way the airlines were approaching the issue. And I thought it could be done much better. And also just because the crew deserves it. I think they deserve the backing of the airline and, yeah, and they deserve, it shouldn't fall on them mm-hmm, to figure it to out. figure it out on the fly. Well, and when it's something that may have happened to them as well. And it's every crew is different, right? They, they're all taught, you know, just tossed together. It's and never the same crew. Something else I'd say is that airlines would often say, oh no, we train our, we train our flight crew and how to respond to disruptive passengers. And that was a point that I always came back and said, there is a difference between responding to a disruptive passenger and then a trauma informed or response to someone who's been assaulted. They're very different and they needed to, they were not making a distinction between that. And so I wanted to see a distinction between the way you respond to someone who's been assaulted and the way you handle the person who's doing the assaulting. So that was another thing that I wanted to, to really, to, to address again, it's, yeah, it was not something that I initially had pursued, but, and also, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Well, well done. That's all I have to say <laughs> to you about that. <laughs> where can people find out? I often ask where people can find a 
person, let's say on social media, yeah. you're probably, that's probably not the most appropriate question for you, no, but no. where can people find yeah. out either more, well, uh, more about your races or about yeah. what you're doing and where would you want to send people? So there's a couple of things. So the project that I run at work, it's called the women, well, two of the projects, which I think would be interesting too, if people want to learn more about our work in breast cancer is the Women's Empowerment Cancer Advocacy Network. And that's We Can. We Can. Yeah. And then the Breast Cancer Initiative 2.5. And those are at Fred Hutch and University of Washington, Seattle Cancer Care. And those can be found through those websites, the Fred Hutch website. I think for my race, our team is Sail Like a Girl, and that's saillikeagirl.us. And you can also find out more about us on the R2AK website. We have a Facebook page for sale, Team Sail Like a Girl and an Instagram. And so does R2AK. And then for my... And that's R2AK. Right. Okay. And right. R, what's the stands, R? It stands for Race to Race Alaska. Race to Alaska. Thanks. Um, and there's a fabulous promo video that I highly recommend checking out that the race puts on because it's it's hilarious. Great. They have and an I'll incredible link to, sense of humor. I'll link to all those in the show notes. Too. Yes. And then and read the bios because they're hilarious. And then my advocacy work around airplanes that I have a Facebook page that for short is PAPSA, but it's protect airline passengers from sexual assault. And there's a Facebook page. And there's a Twitter, but I'm just not a good Twitter. I, I'm in I like images and I don't know. I'm not I've, I'm not a tweeter. I haven't really been able to get around Twitter. Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> I like Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And You've, actually, you know, Facebook for all the, you know, I know it's been controversial, um, but there's just, I have to say from an advocacy standpoint, it's been so valuable to the advocates I work with in other countries, again, in places where you have stigmatized issues and people want to be able to access information and may want to access it, you know, it creates, you know, those groups, it creates yeah, communities yeah. that allows it people does. to tap into things that they may not feel comfortable talking about. So, and also with the airline issue, I, Facebook allowed me to, you know, I don't mean to be, it just allowed me to, to raise awareness as one person. And I think that is, a, a, you know, something that technology has let us do. I don't, when I used to work in civil society development 20 years ago, and we didn't have these tools, it was a lot slower, you know, grassroots movements. It, it, Absolutely. You, didn't, you couldn't have that explosive connections that you can now that where things can really take off and you have the ability to get your word out and for good or for bad. But I think it, that really helped me because really this whole thing is, has been me and a Facebook page. <laughs> you know, just So that's, I have to say. Well, been, great. We'll find yeah. you on the Facebook yeah. page too. So super. Allison, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah. I just can't tell you how <laughs> how excited I was to chat with you. And then to, like I said, to, it, it kind of all started with the incident. Yeah. Um, how I heard about you. But then as I dug in a little bit deeper and I thought, oh man, she's doing some really cool stuff. I really want to talk to her. So thank you for sharing all of that Absolutely. Uh, no, information. Thank you. Yeah, it's and been best... an honor to be part of, and I don't know which number I am. But... <laughs> oh, you're late 40s. Late I think. 40s? Yeah, yeah. We're okay, heading, just, we're heading I just don't want to be, I don't want to be 45. Yeah. Just no, no, no. <laughs> Uh-oh, you but, might be. No, it's okay. <laughs> No, um, no, it's really, really quite an honor to be included in such a group of amazing women. I've enjoyed really, I want to go listen to more of them. Oh, good. Stuff. Well, I, I am honored that I get to sit down with, uh, with these ladies and have a chat. So you yeah. include it. So thanks again. Thank you. Boy, she's really juggling a number of pretty incredible things right now. And to think that for fun, she's going to go off on that big sailing adventure. I hope you'll follow her journey through uh, the website and social media outlets, and I'll link to those uh, in the show notes. By now, you know the drill. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and the podcast in general with anyone whom you think might enjoy it. Word of mouth is really so important in helping get the word out about the podcast. Believe it or not, some people have no idea what a podcast is. Can you believe it? Uh, with more listeners, that will help me attract more guests down the road. Don't forget to check out my tours at wandertours.com. And if you'd like to connect with me, you can friend me on Facebook and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. And I'll actually uh, be posting photos from this Ireland trip there as well. 
You can find out more about me by visiting wanderlustandlipstick.com. Sign up for my newsletter on that website, and you'll receive a series of tips for making your travels safer. Ladies, you can join us on our Be Bold Facebook group. We've got nearly 2,600 members in that group, and it's a community of amazing women who are sharing their wins and sometimes their struggles. Uh, We learn from each other, and we share some great information and encouragement. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Be Bold podcast. And until next time, be bold.